I need some speaker traction. before the break. Um, so to build a defensible and sustainable business model, you need strong moats around your company. But dramatic shifts in technology are rendering existing moats useless and leaving CEOs feeling like it's harder and harder and even impossible to build defense, a defensible business. So our next speaker is Jerry Chen from uh, Greylock, who's going to talk about how to build new moats. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. <clears throat> So my understanding is I'm the last thing between you, coffee, ice cream, sugar, caffeine, right? All the good stuff that you need. Uh, so we'll make this hopefully a, a quick and enjoyable 15 minutes or, or plus or minus. And what I want to talk about is, um, you know, I wrote a blog about a year, year and a half ago called The New Moat, which was really about a framework of valuing business models and how to create defensible business models. And that led to a bunch of questions and conversations. And so I'm working on a follow-up framework I call Castles in the Cloud. And it's actually how to build business models in the shadow of these large super incumbents, like these super castles, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft. So Greylock Partners, just two seconds, we're an early stage venture capital firm, been around for 50 plus years based in Silicon Valley. Been lucky enough to be involved with some great companies like LinkedIn, Facebook, Dropbox, Instagram, Workday, uh, more recently companies like Docker, uh, Cato Networks, and Rubrik. I myself focus on enterprise software. Before joining Greylock, I spent almost 10 years at a company called VMware. I was there about 250 employees, about 15,000, and about 100 million revenues, about 5 billion. So the focus of my talk is really going to be more from an enterprise software perspective, but hopefully if you're following um, in the consumer space or uh, different markets, it'll be useful too. First, why do we care about business model modes? Like modes is kind of overused term in blogs and, and B-school classes, and really there's, there's two reasons why. One, as a founder, you want to build something sustainable, right? Defensible against your competition, other startups, but also defensible against incumbents. Because once you have a great idea, a great market, a great technology, the large incumbents be Apple, Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft can attack you. Secondly, as an investor, I want to build sustainable businesses that can go the distance. Like, I'm not looking to invest in a company that's around for two, three, four years. I want to be in a company and on the board for five, 10, 15 years and really build a, a defining company. And so the question is, what kind of startups, what kind of uh, advantage do you have that if it's working, will keep on working? And the third area which you really care about is when you see moats of incumbents, how do you overcome them? So you look at Apple, Google, Facebook, um, and you say, okay, they have such daunting advantages. What are the weaknesses? How can I attack this, this large, large castle? <clears throat> so last year I created this, this framework I called System of Intelligence, or what I call the new modes. And historically, there have been two layers to the enterprise stack. There's what we call the system of engagement and the system of record. The system of record is really a, a core enterprise information system, a core set of, of data. It could be your, your employees. So CRM is a system record of your employees. It could be, I'm sorry, of your customers. It could be HCM, human capital management. So HCM or human capital management is a system of record for your HR data and your employee data. ERP is basically a system record for your financial data and your assets, and IT service management is a system record for all your IT assets, all your IT questions. And so this typically is a database, like uh, built on Oracle, built on Microsoft SQL Server, and an application workflow on top of it, a system of record. And every enterprise has three or four major system records, customers, employees, assets. And you'll see large companies surround them. So Salesforce is the large dominant company in the customer system record. Workday is the leading company in your employee system record. SAP Oracle kind of dominates the, IT, the information around financial assets. System engagement is exactly what it sounds like. It's how you as an end user interact with these applications, how you as a, as a business user interact with the system of record. And so this goes through these different waves. So first it was like the mainframe terminal. That was the engagement UI. Then it was Windows as a system of engagement because everything went through the Windows operating system. And then came along the web browsers. Remember like Netscape versus the Internet Explorer, kind of the browser wars in, in the 90s, because the browser represented a new system of engagement, a new way for you to access information in your system record. And then obviously you've seen um, mobile as a system of, of, of engagement. Again, the app store is a different way to sell ads, sell applications, sell information to your eyeballs. And then more recently, we've seen other systems of engagement, Slack and this kind of rise of chat. It's not just Slack in the enterprise. It's WhatsApp. It's iMessage. It's SMS. It's WeChat, if you look at a bunch of models in Asia. 
And then increasingly we're seeing new emerging systems of engagement like Alexa or, um, or Siri, ambient voice and becoming a new system of engagement, like how you actually interact with these applications. Now, system intelligence is um, a thesis that I built about a year ago on how to invest in this space. So if you're a startup, you're a founder, you're trying to build a, a company around customer data, it's really hard to build any AI or any ML on top of customer data that Salesforce is going to have already. The Salesforce actually owns a system of record, and so they're going to build Einstein on top of their data and create a system intelligence on top of their CRM data. Likewise, Workday will build their own system of intelligence on top of HR data, and so on and so on. So a system of intelligence is what I believe a, a defining moat for startups. If you can build a mo moat or build a system of intelligence across multiple systems of record. So it means you've got to combine not one data source, but two or three different data sources so you have a more powerful technology advantage than just one system of record. Or you can actually take a system engagement, and if you're inside the system engagement, so you actually own the UI, you own the workflow, you own the engagement of the end user, like your Slack, you're the App Store, you're, you're the Android Store, you can actually build information around how customers are using the application and what data they're looking for. So the system of intelligence becomes this fertile ground for emerging new category of applications that I call the new modes. Now, that led to a bunch of conversations, a bunch of investments I, as a VC in the past year have done. I kept getting this question. It's like, how do you compete against not the 800-pound gorillas, but the 8,000-pound gorillas with have these huge, huge moats? Like, how can a system of intelligence fight against Amazon, Google, Microsoft? And that led me to a bunch of thinking, saying, well, a system intelligence is, is one way to fight the incumbents, but you know, what are the other vulnerabilities to try to attack um, these massive, massive clouds? So a quick reminder, like, why are these moats in the sky behind Amazon, Google, Microsoft, you, know, you can argue Apple and Facebook in the consumer space have the same advantages? Why are they so um, daunting and impossible to attack right now? So we're really this generation of ascendancy, these new incumbents are so powerful right now. If you look at their market caps or valuations, it's reflecting that. Because they're built upon you know, basically two or three hard, large um, moats. First is economies of scale. To build a cloud or build an application or build infrastructure at size and scale of a Google or Amazon or Facebook or Microsoft would take billions and billions of dollars of CapEx. Dollars that you're not going to raise from a VC, dollars most companies can't even spend themselves. You look at IBM or Oracle or all these other companies trying to catch up to Amazon in the cloud space, they're, they're a distant fifth, sixth, seventh, and it, it's a mile apart. Second, have network effects. And network effects are defined by Metcalf's law, which means the more people using my platform creates more value for everybody else. And so on Amazon, the more people on Amazon, the more data, the more applications, the more services on Amazon as a cloud creates more value for everybody else on the same cloud. And lastly, these clouds are so powerful, these castles are so entrenched because they have the customer top of the funnel, which means they have the, your credit card, they have your email address. So if you want to sell one more service, one more application, one more widget to your end users, they say, hey, how would you like to buy email? How would you like to buy a new database? How would you like to buy a new security feature? And so if they own the top of the funnel, you as a startup think, look, I might have better technology, but how do I actually get to my, my customers, my end users? So there's six different frameworks I've been toying around with in, uh, around how to fight Amazon, Google, Microsoft. And uh, first and foremost, they're not mutually exclusive. You can combine strategies. Second warning, um, I don't know if they're right or wrong. It's, it's a thesis and a framework I use when I have conversations with founders. And um, some might prove true, some might prove wrong, and I'm probably missing a bunch of different strategies out there. I'm hoping you folks in the room will come educate me with some kick-ass business plan and an idea how to beat these guys. So the, the six strategies, the first one's not really a strategy to beat them. It's basic avoidance. It's, the, it's a judo strategy. If you can't beat them, join them, which really means that, look, these guys are going to be ascended. Um, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, they're the, they're the Windows operating system, they're the Oracle database of their time today. And so what you want to do is build a business model that benefits from the, their growth, from their expansion. So they're going to do better AI. They're going to do better computer vision, better voice recognition. Don't try to fight them that layer. Ride on top of their technologies and build on top of them. And that means you've got to build a better product, you've got to service your customers, or create what I call affinity, so a, a better um, bond or loyalty or tie or connection to your actual end users is what I call affinity. 
The second aspect of five things I call own the end user, or this is what I call um, practitioner-led go-to-market. So you sell it directly to the practitioner, and you own the relationship with the practitioner. In the cloud space, and enterprise space, today that's mainly the developer. Like developer-led go-to-market, they have the credit cards, the developers are king, they're making a bunch of choices in technology. But in today's technology world, it's not just the developer that's the main practitioner. 10, 20 years ago, the main IT buyer was the CIO. Maybe the CFO to write the checks. But the CIO said what tech you can and can't use. Your enterprise business is full of dozens and dozens of different practitioner personas. For example, developer is one, maybe the most popular one. But we have a company called Figma selling to designers. Right, so if you're, uh, uh, they're fighting against Adobe in the creative suite. And so they own the practitioner that is the designer. You can say um, reporting tools, selling right to finance, for their fp &A function, own that practitioner. Marketing, uh, my friend Samir Delakia of Sangrid was here this morning. He owned the marketing developer, the marketing buyer. That's a practitioner. Because what you have now with cloud and SaaS and app stores is the ability to bypass a CIO, go right to the practitioner, and have him or her buy your product. So own that audience. Um, for the developers in the room, we want to do a developer product. This is, is, is 10 times more important to own the practitioner, own the audience, because in this business world of the cloud, you're finding what I call rock in a hard place, open source in a cloud place. So an open source is going to anchor business model towards free, and cloud saying, hey, I'll take your open source technology, run as a service, thank you very much. So if you don't actually own the practitioner, own the end user, you don't have a viable moat. You don't have a business model. <clears throat> Next technology, third aspect, is what I call making deep IP work. And so in this cloud world, there's still an opportunity to actually have deep, defensible IP that's very, very hard. A couple examples, like Snowflake builds a data warehouse on top of Amazon that competes with Redshift. They do a great technology advantage of separating um, storage from compute to scale independently. Trifactive, one of our investments, does ETL, and they actually have machine learning driven um, enterprise translation of your data that's on top of Google. Instabase is another company that I'm on the board of, basically has um, technology around data transformation, data analysis that is years ahead of any of the cloud companies. So one, you have to own deep IP. Hopefully it's IP that actually goes against the grain of, of the incumbents. Fourth, no cloud company can do it all. So Amazon launches like 200 services a, a year. Google, Microsoft are that as well. And, each of those companies probably do every product, every service, 20, 30, 40% complete. So they don't actually own the workflow 100%. They don't own the 100% of all the features, all the aspects you care about. So if you don't own the audience, do the product better and do it completely. So companies like New Relic, Sumo Logic, Datadog, AppDynamics, these are loved by IT administrators, loved by developers, even though each of the cloud providers have their own version of these technologies. Because they actually do the complete long tail of features, the fit and finish, the user experience the developer cares about is 10 times better than what these guys can do. Don't forget, these are large, large companies. They launch a lot of services, they launch a lot of features. Figure out what your pain point is and own that feature set own that journey 100%. Next way to fight them, multi-cloud. This is one I hear a lot about, like no one wants to be locked into one cloud, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and so people want to have a multi-cloud strategy, which I believe in. So I think the right company that can handle like the data gravity issue of moving data around cloud to cloud, or data privacy from cloud to cloud, will actually have a good chance of building something unique. The question is how to monetize and how to build something that's multi-cloud, and I haven't quite figured that out yet but multi-cloud is a viable strategy. The next two things are basically futuri more futuristic distribution changes. One is edge. So cloud is all about large centralized computing and one, one or multiple data centers. Uh, compute goes to the edge, be VR devices, your wearables, your, your self-driving car, your robots. Latency matters, so pushing compute to the edge means that you're actually stretching out the cloud and it's debatable whether or not Amazon, Google, and, and, and Microsoft can actually build enough small presences out there to reach their end users. And there's a lot of talk about blockchain, and I don't want to talk about Bitcoin and crypto stuff, but this whole idea of decentralization, right? Blockchain is about decentralized your application, decentralized ownership of everything. And so in a world where decentralized applications matter, then that means cloud and centralized compute, centralized storage doesn't matter. So pushing things to the edge, decentralization of your application, if those two trends are real, then that's a legitimate threat to the cloud incumbents. My final conclusion is, look, it's conventional wisdom, 
don't fight the, the giants, right? And, and boardrooms around um, Silicon Valley, around Vancouver, around the world, they're saying, oh crap, can't Amazon do this? Can't Google do this? Can't Facebook do this? So don't be worried about the incumbents. There's a way to fight them, but you have to do something different, something slightly contrarian, but make sure you're right. And with that, thank you very much. I need some traction. You need some traction. Let's get some traction.